Amen. Good morning. It's good to see all of you on this beautiful day the Lord has made as we get to gather together and praise God with one another. Let's continue this time of worship with prayer. Loving God, we thank you so much for a new day. We thank you for the gift of your love and grace in our lives and for the opportunity to worship with one another. We ask that you would pour out your Holy Spirit on us as we gather that you would move among us and form us more fully into the people you've made us and called us to be. We thank you and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to stand as you are able as we sing our opening hymn number 384. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Mount Zion United Methodist Church. We're happy to have you here worshiping with us. A few announcements in the bulletin to draw your attention to. Uh, we had our uh, church council meeting this past week, and you'll see uh, at the bottom uh, several notes from that uh, meeting, but one I'll draw your attention to is the last one. We are in need of caring adults to lead Sunday school lessons with our children and youth. So if you would uh, like to volunteer to help with uh, Sunday School Lessons, please see uh, Pastor Jonathan. And then also May 29th is Confirmation Sunday, so join us in worship to support Braylon, who uh, has her last uh, Confirmation class tonight, and we'll have a uh, dinner, a covered dish meal to celebrate that after church that day, so May 29th. And then you'll see just under that, Sakahachi is back, so after, um, I guess, a couple years off of or two years off of Sakahatchee, any youth 14 and older uh, and adults who are interested in attending uh, from July 9th to 16th need to uh, let Pastor Jonathan know. And I think that's all. Any, any other announcements? So I 
Benji, I forgot to give you a heads up, but I wanted to, to speak to the advocate this morning. There's a paragraph in your bulletin about it, and if you grew up in the Methodist Church, you, you've heard of it. Uh, it. It used to be the, hmm, had a different name. Do you remember the Christian? <laughs> that goes way back before his time, too. <laughs> it goes back to 1837, and you know what was going on in Central in 1837. Even before that, out at 12 Mile Creek, past the Central Elementary School, the first Mount Zion was meeting in a meeting house. That's where they started, and that was in actually a little bit before this paper. So it's changed names through the years, but it is still alive and well, in fact, very well. It, as you read in the bulletin there, you'll see about the awards it's won. The, it's just a staff of two, the editor and the associate editor. And uh, Jessica Brody is a, a wonderful asset to the Methodist Conference here in, her, in South Carolina, and, and her husband also do lots of work. But uh, I just picked up the um, April edition. I subscribe. There's information uh, and a few issues back there. First come, first serve. Anybody's welcome to, to pick those up. Um, but I grew up in the Methodist Church, so that's sort of logical. If you did not grow up in the Methodist Church, that might be even more of a reason why you would like to know what all is going on in Methodism in South Carolina. Um, and of course, with on the front page of the April General Conference postponed to 2024. We hear, heard about that through the newsletter, through Jonathan. He keeps us in touch with certain things. He can't keep us in touch with everything. If you're interested in what's going on with Methodists in South Carolina, and as some of you know, there's a lot going on with Methodists in South Carolina. And uh, in terms of uh, one of the sections I always like to look at, they, they pull information from the archives. And uh, the, this particular issue, he lifts up how it was 1972, 50 years ago, that uh, we became United Methodists. And guess what? <laughs> In 2022, what are we becoming? Ununited Methodists. Uh, but anyway, moving on. United Women in Faith. We heard about that through um, Elizabeth Finley, uh, how United Methodist women now are called United Method uh, Women in Faith. That was also in the church newsletter. If you want to know some of the more details. Um, so, uh, just again, a couple other little things in this issue. Uh, did you know that Lawrence Chapel has a drive-through food pantry? And they even have a special building for it now. Um, a couple other things I enjoy are the, the uh, historians section. Uh, I have to admit, the older I've gotten, I tend to look at obituaries to be sure I'm not overlooking some friend or, or family. And having been Methodist in South Carolina all my life, uh, this particular issue happens to uh, report the passing of the pastor at Clemson United Methodist in 1993 when Ansel's mother passed away. He did her memorial service. That's Dr. Charles Johnson, if any of you happen to remember him. The last page always has the Sunday School lessons from the International Sunday School series that some churches use, some don't, but You've got the whole month's Sunday school lessons there if you'd like to read those. And, oh gee, let's see, what else did I mark? Summer camp. I'm a great believer in going to Christian summer camp. Um, I have to admit, I was saved at a Baptist camp, but I think that still counts okay, too. Uh, but anyway, I could go on and on. It's just $10 for an online subscription, 20 for the hard copy. I'm a hard copy person. So, of course, you have information, Jonathan knows all about it, and um, if I can answer any questions, I'd be happy to do so, too. The Advocate is a great resource for keeping up with news, and, and I know Mount Zion's appeared in there a number of times with really good things um, that have gone on here, so I'll lift that up. While we're on the subject of our connectional Methodist uh, ministry, I just wanted to share, I don't have the number right in front of me, it's on my phone and I left it over there, but last week we did our Epworth Children's Home offering, and I think Elizabeth Finley had said for the year our goal was like $1,060 or something like that. Well, last week we brought in over $1,400. Um, and so thank you all uh, for your generosity and just praise God. 
for this church's uh, support of that ministry. So just wanted to celebrate that and everyone's generosity today. Thank you, Jonathan, and thank you, Sharon. I, too, read the obituaries, even though I'm younger, but, um, and, and Dr. Johnson was a fine man. I remember him well, too. Um, any other announcements? All right, please join me for the prayer of confession found in your bulletin. God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son taught us that others would know who we are by the love we show. We confess that we are sometimes better known for what we do or what we think or what we wear. Forgive us and help us live in ways that overflow with your love so that others would know that we are yours. Amen. Good morning. We are going to be reading Psalm 148 on page 861 in your hymnal. And of course, you'll read the bold. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise the Lord in the heights. Praise the Lord, all his angels. Praise the Lord, all his hosts. Praise the Lord, sun and moon. Praise the Lord, all shining stars. Praise the Lord, highest heavens, and all waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord who commanded, and they were created. Who established them forever and ever, and fixed their bounds which cannot be passed. Praise the Lord from the earth, sea monsters, and all deeps. Fire and hail, snow and smoke, stormy wind. Mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars. Beasts and all cattle, creeping things and flying birds. Kings of the earth and all peoples, princes and all rulers of the earth. Let the men and the maidens together, old men and the children. Let them praise the name of the Lord, whose name alone is exalted, whose glory is above earth and heaven. God has raised up the horn for his people. Praise for all his faithful ones. For the people of Israel who are near their God. Praise the Lord. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I invite you to stand as you are able as we reaffirm our faith together with the words of the Apostle. <laughs> I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated.
And at this time, the children are invited forward for a special children's time at the front. Children's time, not fitness time. All right. So how's everybody doing this morning? Pretty good? On, oh, I think so, yep. So I brought with me, and y'all know these, okay? So I didn't, we had some others with us today, then maybe they would be able to, this would be new to them. But what is this that I'm showing you? Our rules for where? Our house. Yep, these are our house rules, right? So let's see. Um, Micah, you want to read the first one for everybody? Be kind. And then what are some of the examples it gives underneath it? You want to read those, Isaac? All right. Yeah, etc. Yep, yep. So share, clean up after yourself, no name calling, no pushing, etc. Good. So that's some of what it means to be kind. All right. What about um, number two there, Isaac? Respect privacy. So we said what that means don't just go barging into each other's rooms, right? Knock first, right? And respect each other's things. Okay. And what about um, the third one, Michael? What does it say? Be respectful and use your manners, yeah, and so we practice that. So those are our three big house rules, aren't they? Um, now, if we had some others with us, I would ask them if they have any house rules, but those are our house rules, right? So I was, so those are our house rules. Did you know that Jesus kind of gave his followers some house rules? Did you know that? Not that you know of. So... We talk about being part of God's family sometimes, right? And so Jesus' followers, sometimes he would call them brothers. And so Jesus kind of saw all of us who follow him as his family. And he gave us a list of house rules that only had one rule. Did you know that? Did you know they only had one rule? So, so when <laughs> they're lucky. So when... So when he was with his disciples for the very last time, and he ate the last meal, because they ate together, kind of like they were a family, and he said, all right, this is my last time with all of you, and so I have one rule that I want you all to live by as part of my family. And you know what that rule was? So to teach, kind of. So they did a lot of teaching and taught other people about Jesus. But the most basic rule that he gave them, he said, a new commandment I give you, love each other. That's it. Love each other. So if that was important enough for Jesus to tell his disciples, do you think Jesus still wants us to also love each other? Yes. All right. One yes, two maybes. All right. So, what are some ways, if Jesus wants us to love each other, what are some ways that we can do that? What are some ways that we might love each other? Isaac, this afternoon, I bet you'll have some opportunities to love Sarah and Micah. What are some things you could do to show love? By not digging into their business? Sure. Sure. That would work, and maybe they could do the same for you, it sounds like. All right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah, you want others to treat you the same way um, that you want to be treated, right? Yeah, can you treat others the way you want to be treated? Yeah. Micah, can you think of a way that you could maybe show love to one of these two today? What about with toys? Can you share? Yeah, you can share. Yep. Maybe we can. Uh, 
You could play with them, yeah, that's a much better answer than the one I had, you're right, yes. You could play with them, that's good. And maybe if you want something, what's that really, really kind word that we sometimes say if we want something? Please, oh, oh what, what is it? Please, yep. <laughs> So those are great ways that we can all love each other, all right? So remember that what was Jesus' one last rule that he gave us? To love each other. That's right. All right, can you all help me as we lead all of these people in the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. All right, y'all can have a seat. And I invite everyone, as you're able, to please stand as we sing our hymn number 526. Please be seated. As we move into a time where we do take it to the Lord in prayer, I invite those who are worshiping online to share any requests you have in the comments so we can name those out loud. But what are some of those needs and praises that we have today? For those who couldn't hear, we've been lifting up um, Alan's brother-in-law in prayer, and he did pass away this past Sunday. And so we will want to remember um, the family of, of Gary. We want to remember uh, his sister Linda as they grieve that. Are there other prayers and praises that we have today? I know it's good to see Vicki in the back.
Okay. Connie asks prayers for her sister-in-law, Leanne, who's having heart rhythm problems. I know it looks like we have um, a prayer need. I can only read part of it, but uh, Xander, who we have been lifting up in prayer, he's had a setback with his cancer, and so we want to remember Xander, seven years old, in our prayers. Yeah, Angie. So praise for a safe and fun trip together for Angie and her daughter and then for safe travels uh, now to Oregon and for work that started there. Are there other prayers or praises this morning? Yes, yes. Continued prayers for Christine Reeves who is back home and um, getting, getting adjusted and certainly continued prayers for Phil Davis as well with his health. All right. So praises for accomplishments for both Quint and Braylon. That's wonderful to be able to celebrate those things. And their faces are getting redder, so you were right, Benji. <laughs> Any others? If not, let's join our hearts in a time of prayer. Loving God, we thank you that you are with us in the joys and in the sorrows and the mountaintops and in the valleys. God, we just lift up all those needs that we've named out loud and those that we hold in the silence of our hearts. We lift up all those in need of healing. We lift up especially Christine and Phil and Vicki. We also lift up as well Xander as he um, continues to look for health and just for his family. We lift up all those that we have named who are having health issues and just ask your blessings on them, that you would give them strength and health and that you would be the great physician in their lives. God, we lift up all those who are grieving. We lift up um, Alan's family with the death of his brother-in-law and just ask your blessings on them and your strength and peace in their lives. And we just thank you for the gift of your life that, that, that of that life that because of your love and grace has no end. We lift up those joys that we have, accomplishments and experiences with loved ones. And just thank you for those blessings that we have along the way um, that help energize us and give us enthusiasm um, and strength for moving forward with joy. And so we just thank you for those praises that we have to celebrate. God, we just lift up all those other needs that we have that you are already working in the midst of and just entrust them to your care. We ask that you would help us be people of prayer who can take everything to you in prayer, knowing that you love us and that you care for those situations as much as we do. We ask your blessings on us now as we continue in this time of worship, that you would just open up our hearts and our minds to what you would do among us today that would be formed more fully into the image of your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you and pray this in his name. Amen. I invite you to stand as you are able for the reading of our gospel today, which comes from John chapter 13. Even as we continue to be in the season of Easter, um, the lectionary readings right now go back to before Easter, and so we get to be reminded of the journey that Jesus went on and the teachings that he had for us. So I invite you to hear now John chapter 13, verses 31 through 35. Now when Judas had gone out, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. If God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and will glorify him at once. Little children, I am with you only a little longer. 
You will look for me, and as I said to the Jews, so I say to you now, where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. This is the word of God for all of us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. And I invite you to join me in prayer. O oh, loving God, as we meditate on your scriptures and your word is proclaimed, we ask that you would help us hear with joy what you say to us this very day. We pray this in your son Jesus' name. Amen. The actor Viola Davis is perhaps best known for some of her star roles in movies such as The Help or in a number of television appearances. But what's perhaps less known about this South Carolina native is that she grew up in abject poverty and lived with the trauma during her entire childhood of having a father um, who was a raging alcoholic and who was abusive. In a recent interview, she recounts one instance as a 14-year-old girl how she was looking forward to uh, a school field trip one day and had had that on her mind for weeks that this was going to be a great day at school. And then the night before, her father had one of his raging episodes and she was worried about the safety of her mom and all night long, she didn't sleep a wink. And so she got to school the next day for that field trip that she had so been looking forward to. And she was despondent, unable to feel or experience any of the joy of this thing that she had looked forward to so much. Davis went on to describe her experience years and years later, when that father who had inflicted so much harm on her and her family finally was about to pass away from pancreatic cancer. And as she and her siblings gathered around that man who had caused so much harm and heartache in their lives for so many years, their father did not waste his time or theirs by talking about trivial and unimportant things that did not matter. As he knew that he didn't have much time left on this earth, he only said the words that were the, the most important things he could possibly have said to them. I am sorry. I am sorry. The last thing he said was the most important thing that he could have possibly said. Not only as a pastor, but as someone who has lost many family members over the years, I've spent a lot of time with people as their time on earth has neared its end. And those experiences have typically followed that same pattern as what Davis and her family experienced uh, when her father was nearing his death. When people know that they don't have much time left, they typically don't talk about the weather or sports or all of those trivial things that we sometimes talk about when we feel like we have plenty of breath left to waste on this earth. No, people who know that their hour is drawing near typically only talk about the most important thing that they have left to say. Things like, I'm sorry, or I love you, or I forgive you, take care of each other. Y'all get over y'all's differences with each other and get along for crying out loud. Life is short. Things like that. If someone knows that they don't have much time left on this earth, then pay attention to what they say because chances are they are saying the most important thing that they can think of to share. Now, I share that because when Jesus shared the words that we heard just a few moments ago from John chapter 13, Jesus knew that he did not have much time left. As he spoke to his closest friends, he had just shared with them the last meal that he would ever eat with them before his crucifixion. Within it, uh, Jesus, Judas had just left the table 
and had gone so that he could bring people who would arrest Jesus. And within uh, 24 hours, Jesus would be tried and crucified and buried away in a tomb. Jesus knew that his time was nearing its end, and so he did what most other people do when their time is nearing its end. He told those who were closest to him what he believed was the most important thing that he had left to share with them. Now, friends, Jesus could have told his closest friends and followers anything. Jesus could have said, all right, I don't have much time left on this earth, so I'm going to finally tell you, here is the right way to read the Bible. Or he could have told them, here are the right things to believe about God, and here are the wrong things to believe about God, and make sure that y'all keep that straight, because that's really important to me. But Jesus didn't do that, <laughs> which means that apparently that wasn't the most important thing to Jesus. Jesus could have said, here is the right stance to take on this particular issue, or here is the, the right way to worship God. But Jesus didn't do that either, which suggests that, again, that wasn't the most important thing to Jesus either. Of all of the words Jesus could have possibly left his followers with, the one thing he chose to leave them with was this. A new command I give you. Love one another. As I have loved you, so you must also love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. That was the most important thing to Jesus. So important that Jesus repeated those words, love one another, three times. Now, I'm just going to say it. I would really prefer it if Jesus would have said something else <laughs> at that point. If Jesus had chosen instead to tell us once and for all the right way to read and interpret Scripture, just think of all of the theological arguments and painful church splits and even crusades that could have been avoided because we would have known who was right and who was wrong, and it would have been black and white. We would have, it would have made things so much easier, I think. If Jesus had spelled out the right stance that his followers should have taken on any of the contemporary issues of our time, then just think how peaceful the world would be, right? We would know the right answer and the wrong answer. Everybody would vote the same way. Election season would be this jubilant time of everybody just agreeing on everything together because Jesus would have told us the right stance to take on everything. If Jesus had said, here's the right way to worship, or here's the right way to talk about God, then following Jesus would be pretty easy. But friends, apparently Jesus didn't think that being right or that having things easy were as important as being like him. And what was Jesus if not loving? So who is it that Jesus wants us to love and how is it that Jesus would have us love them? Well, the short answer is that Jesus said we are to love one another. And I don't know about you, but that kind of makes me feel good because one another seems a lot smaller than everybody, right? Because one another sounds like a group of people that I'm already part of. I love loving one another, right? That, that you know, people who already see things the way I do, people who already love me back, you know, when I love them, loving one another seems a whole lot easier than loving everybody. It's kind of like, I, I think back to this church basketball game I played in one time when I was about 11 or 12 years old. Keep in mind, it was a church basketball game. And I was probably about four and a half feet tall, 75 pounds soaking wet with bowling balls in each of my hands. And on the other team, there was a kid who was about six feet tall probably about 200 pounds. It was a 12 and under league. He had a five o'clock shadow, and I'm pretty sure he had a missing birth certificate because nobody could prove that he wasn't 12. And at one point in that game, that kid or, or grown man threw a, a pass that I intercepted. And the only thing standing between me and that basket 
and an easy layup was him. And so as I was racing around him, apparently he had this revelation that he did not enjoy running and chasing people who were smaller than him. And so he decided, I, I don't know if this is exactly what he did, this is how I remember it, and said he just picked me up and threw me in to the front row of the bleachers where I landed in the lap, remember this is a church basketball game, I landed in the lap of a woman who was apparently his mother. Now, I don't remember whether or not any punches were thrown, but what I remember is that the good, upstanding, righteous Christians who were on my team stood up for me against those gosh-awful Baptists on the other team. They stood up for me because as far as they were concerned, I was part of their group. I was part of us for them. In our world, it's easy for us to define one another in that same kind of way and to love one another in that same kind of way. We will warmly greet a complete stranger who we have never met who's wearing our favorite team's colors, right? But we won't even notice someone <laughs> Who isn't? We will look for the best in the person who's the part of the same political team that we root for. And we'll always look for the worst in people who are on the other side. We love those who we feel deserve our love, and we don't worry so much about those who have not earned our love and respect. Loving one another, those who are part of us, is so much easier than loving everybody because that's messy and that's hard and so i don't think it's an accident that jesus's commandment to love one another is sandwiched right in between two stories about people who were not incredibly loving toward him john 13 31 begins when he had gone out jesus said who is it who had just gone out well that was judas and why had he gone out to betray Jesus into the hands of those who would kill him in exchange for a bag of coins. Judas was not rooting for the same team as Jesus. Judas was not a steadfast, faithful friend who deserved love and respect back. Judas was not someone who we would include as one of us. Judas was a sellout. He was a backstabber. And so when Jesus said, love one another to people who were sitting at a table where Judas had just been, guess who was included in Jesus' idea of one another? Judas. The same guy who was in the process of betraying him into the hands of those who would kill him. Right after instructing his followers, to love one another. Jesus predicted that within a few hours, another one of his friends who was sitting right there at the table named Peter would deny knowing him not one time, not two times, but three times. He wasn't the kind of guy who would stick up for you if you got tossed into the bleachers at a church basketball game, much less if you were having to carry a cross. Peter wasn't the kind of friend <laughs> who we would count as one of us. And yet when Jesus said, love one another, and Peter was sitting there at the table, guess who was included in Jesus' idea of one another? Peter. Which means, friends, that when Jesus said to love one another, he didn't just mean to love your brother and sis or sister in Christ who has always loved you back. He meant to also love that one who maybe has betrayed you. He didn't just mean to love the fellow Christian who has been there by your side in your greatest hour of need. He also meant to love the one who you needed who was nowhere to be found. To love as Jesus loved means to love people who do not deserve it, following the example of, Christ, uh, of Jesus who died for us while we were yet sinners. When Jesus says to love one another, it's really just a... a a softer sounding way for him to say, love everybody. The Judases, the Peters, and everyone in between. So how do we do that? 
The Greek word that is used throughout John 13 by Jesus for love is agape. Agape. It describes the kind of love that God has. It's the same word that's used in that famous passage from John 3.16, where it says, For God so loved the world, God so agape <laughs> the world, that he gave his only son. Elsewhere in John's Gospel, it's the same word that's used to describe the Father's love for Jesus and Jesus' love for others. And it's the same word that the Apostle Paul used in his famous words from 1 Corinthians 13 that we've all probably heard at weddings and that were never intended to be read at weddings. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. Love does not insist on its own way. Love is not irritable. Love keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. That's the kind of love that Jesus was telling his followers to have. Loving one another as Jesus defines one another and as he defines what it means to love each other means being patient with others, even the people who don't deserve your patience. It means not being rude even when it feels like rudeness is exactly what someone else deserves. It means valuing the ways others choose, not just your own way, and letting go of that mental list of resentments that we can wear as a badge of honor, but that feels a lot more like a cross. It means maintaining hope because of the goodness of God and that image of that very same God that resides in every single person who's around the table with us. And friends, when you love others and you practice love towards others in that way, Jesus says, that is how others will know who we are and whose we are. Someone who's much smarter than I am once pointed out that everywhere in that passage from 1 Corinthians 13 where you read the word love, you could just as easily substitute in the name Jesus, and it would still be true. Jesus is patient. Jesus is kind. Jesus is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. Jesus does not keep a record of wrongs, praise the Lord. Jesus does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. Jesus bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Why is it that Jesus knew that others would know who we are and whose we are when we love as he taught us to love? Well, because when we love as Jesus taught us to love, we are being like Jesus so that others will see him when they look at us. When you walk out of those doors in a few moments, you will enter a world where it's thought that being productive is far more important than being patient. You'll enter a world where being right is thought to be more important than being kind. You'll enter a world where forgiving the wrongs that others have done is considered to be weak and where one another doesn't mean everyone and where being successful is more important than being like Jesus. As you enter that world, remember the one thing that Jesus believed that was so important that he saved it for his last moments on earth. A new command I give you. Love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. One of the ways that we love others in response to the love that God has first given to us is by giving back toward the work that God is doing in this community of faith. And so in these next moments, you're invited to give back to God God's tithes and your offerings.
Let us pray. God, for your great love, we give you thanks. We see it through all that you provide for us and for the ways that you care for us. We ask that as we return these gifts to you, that you would bless them and that you would guide our use of them, that they might help others experience your great love too. We thank you and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to remain standing. Our closing hymn is in the little black hymnal. I know uh, some of these we couldn't track down this morning. And so if you don't have one near you, one of the ways that someone else can practice loving one another is to um, hand you one or pass you one, okay? So if you see somebody looking confused, just pass them one of these. 2223. <laughs> Friends, as you go forth from this place, there are so many things that others who meet you and see you might know you by. May we go forth to live in such a way that when others see us, that they will know who we are and whose we are by our love. Go in peace. Amen. Amen.